So welcome everybody, both those of you here and those of you there. This will be the, uh, the first uh, presentation that I'll be giving on this uh, retreat. And I want to offer a kind of overview that um, will put this document, this paper, called A Worldly Eightfold Path, um, into some kind of perspective. Um, I'm not going to go through this text uh, paragraph by paragraph. I might occasionally single out a particular section and focus on it, but I'm assuming that you've read it, uh, or if not, that you'll take the opportunity during this retreat uh, to read this text. Some of you will be, I think, able to follow it quite clearly because you might be familiar with my work. For others, it might be a bit um, confusing because it presents a very well-known, if perhaps not the most well-known Buddhist doctrine, that of the Eightfold Path, in a slightly different way. Uh, arguably a very different way. And what is it then that has led me to reconfigure such a, a primary doctrine? We'll keep coming back to this question, I hope, but just as a, a starter, I feel that the traditional doctrine of the Eightfold Path is framed very much with a particular perspective in mind, and that perspective being that of primarily monastics, monks and nuns, who see the Eightfold Path as the noble Eightfold Path that leads to the end of suffering. That is the standard formula that when you come across the mention of the Eightfold Path, it is generally fleshed out in that longer phrase, the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to the end of suffering. And as such, it uh, presents this path as one in which we um, have, we establish some kind of, uh, of ethical foundation, a sila, morality, um, a philosophical or a doctrinal a set of uh, views, right view, and that then provides a foundation upon which we are able to cultivate the kind of contemplative skill which runs under the headings of mindfulness and uh, samadhi, concentration, collectedness, focus, that is then able to penetrate into the very uh, roots of suffering, which are traditionally understood as ignorance, craving, and so forth and so on, and thereby, by eliminating those causes of suffering, brings us to the experience of nirvana, which is the ending of suffering, which in traditional Buddhism means the ending of the cycle of birth and death. You won't get reborn again if you can eradicate those causes and thereby eradicate the suffering, birth, sickness, aging, death, that those causes give rise to. Now this uh, presentation of the Eightfold Path is not a path, therefore, that is focused on uh, the needs of this world. Um, it's focused on uh, a practice that will lead us to go beyond this world. And that's the phrase that is used. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's unworldly, it's transworldly, it's transcendent. That it uh, starts in this world, but it leads us to never having to come back to this world ever again. We enter the final nirvana, and that is the end of all suffering and woe. Now, I think the structure of the path, the way it's organized, uh, fits that perspective very well. And 
therefore, if we are to consider an eightfold path that is framed within a different perspective, within the perspective, a perspective that we would call secular, a secular perspective is not one that is concerned with transcending this world, but it is concerned with um, living fully in this world, responding to the suffering that we find both in our own lives and in the uh, structures of society. Nowadays, as has already been mentioned, in our sense of uh, ecological crisis and disaster, the threat, the very threat to the, ev uh, to the continuation of life on earth. Uh, and as Winton was saying also earlier, uh, systemic injustices, uh, inequalities, these are not transcendent concerns. They're concerns with the world in which we live now. So I feel therefore that the classical presentation of the Eightfold Path is basically maladapted to that kind of concern, those secular concerns, and therefore, in a way, calls out to be reconsidered and refigured in such a way that it is more adapted to a secular uh, 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 perspective, a secular practice. Now that might sound all very well, but um, is there anything in the early canonical teachings of Gautama that could uh, support such a move? Um, and there is. There is a discourse called the Bhavana Sutta, the discourse on Bhavana. And this is found in the numerical discourses of the Buddha, uh, 771, if you want to look it up. It's a text I came across relatively recently, actually, in the last two or three years. Um, and it provides us with an image that, in a way, gives permission to reconfigure the fundamental clusters of virtues that we find in, uh, in, in the discourses of, of Gautama. The Bhavana Sutta, let's just say a few words about that. The discourse on, on, on Bhavana, Bhavana is a difficult word to translate. It's often translated and in much current Buddhist usage as simply meditation. If you go stay with your Buddhist friends in Sri Lanka or Thailand and they tell you maybe at the end of the afternoon that they're going to, they've got to do their bhavana, bhavana therefore just means meditation. It means they're going to probably sit on a cushion somewhere and maybe do what we just did now, observe our breath, be mindful and so forth and so on. Um, it just means meditation. And in the Tibetan tradition, the word bhavana is translated as gom, and gom is the ordinary, everyday Tibetan word that means meditation. So bhavana, which might loosely be called practice, has come to be specifically the practice of meditation. So in other words, it privileges uh, particular spiritual exercises that will lead you to insights to understanding uh, that will enable you to see through the, the veil of ignorance and thereby undermine the whole process that generates sangsara, birth and death, suffering, and so on. The word bhavana literally means uh, to bring something into being. To bring something into being. Bhava means existence or being. Bhavana means to allow into being or to bring into being. And the closest word we have for that in English is cultivation. To cultivate something. Now, to cultivate something is very much an idea that relates us and connects us to the natural world. Particularly at the Buddha's time, uh, people would be involved in a lot of cultivation. They would be planting and growing and harvesting plants. They, 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 to, 
They bring the plants into being. Something that starts out as a seed is put in the ground, it's then watered, it's exposed to sunlight, and as a result, something begins to, to germinate, and to grow, and then to flourish. Uh, and this is an idea very much of this world, an idea of creating something, uh, of, of developing something. And this, in fact, is how the Buddha describes the task related to the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path, in the first discourse, is described as that which has to be brought into being, that which has to be bhavanad, cultivated. And already here we have a sense that cultivation doesn't just mean meditating, that's part of it, yes, but the whole of the Eightfold Path is that which is to be cultivated from the way we see the world and think about it, the way we speak and act and work, apply ourselves, all of these are qualities that need to be brought into being. And so since the Eightfold Path covers the, the entire spectrum of human life, bhavana, practice, cultivation, is not about just cultivating spiritual quality, mindfulness or concentration, it has to do with cultivating a certain way of being in the world. It starts to connect to the very core sense of, of ethics. Ethics coming from the Greek ethos, which means character, is about cultivating the kind of person you aspire to be. It's about bringing into being the sort of person, the sort of of society, of community, of culture that you seek for yourself and you seek for others. Now, we've already, I think, in a sense, exploded a bit the idea that bhavana is about just meditation. It's far more than that. It's how we live, how we live in the world. And when the Eightfold Path <laughs> or any of these clusters of virtues that we find in all these Buddhist lists um, is presented uh, in a text, we have no choice but to present it in a sequence. You have to start somewhere, and so you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you memorize these eight points. And those, and that sequence then becomes quite quickly established as a kind of doctrine or dogma that is regarded as the way it is. The Eightfold Path starts with right view, right thought, etc., etc., etc. But in the Bhavana Sutta, which is explicitly about what it means to cultivate something, um, explains the pro process of cultivation through a metaphor. And that metaphor is that of a hen hatching her eggs. And the Buddha says that, um, that just as a hen hatches her eggs, and clearly someone who had observed what hens do, or learned from chicken farmers what hens do, is that the hen sits on her eggs and she moves them around with her feet so that the eggs are constantly kept at the same temperature in order that they will hatch around the same time. And therefore, the eggs that are on the perimeter, on the outer edge of the nest, they will need to be moved into the center to get more warmth, and so forth and so on. Can you hear me over this noise? Yeah? So, as soon as you introduce a metaphor of chickens and eggs, you actually um, subvert the whole idea of there being a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because, just visualize for a moment a nest of eggs. Where's the first one? Where's the second one? Where's the, the, there is no order. And especially, in addition, they're being moved around the whole time. So this to me is, as it were, a kind of permission, 
if a permission is needed, but let's say that we want to base what we're um, presenting as the Dharma of Gautama on the basis of his teachings, which I think is fair enough, then here we have uh, an image that invites us actually to reorder the path in order that all of the eggs are given equal attention and, uh, and warmth metaphorically so that the eggs can then hatch. And, and it actually describes it in, in detail. It says the, the, the little chicks will break through the shell and then they will come out of the shell and hatch. Now this too is very much an image of bringing something into being. It's about, it's about hatching eggs. It's, it's very much a life affirming uh, pro process. Uh, you, you're, you're enabling something to be born. It's giving birth to something. And not just one thing, but eight different things in this case. So we have here, therefore, um, uh, the idea that if there are certain eggs that are not being given sufficient attention, they're not warm enough, they need to be brought more into the areas where they can be properly heated. And I think if we look at this in a historical perspective, in the monastic traditional model, certain elements have been given a lot of attention, mindfulness, concentration, maybe views, and these seem to have, as it were, been given a great deal of attention, whereas other elements of the path, um, livelihood, uh, work, um, speech, yeah, sure, they're mentioned, they're there, and, but there's relatively little significance or importance giving to them in contrast to the importance giving to uh, contemplative practices that lead to breaking through the veils of ignorance. If we're going to think of this Eightfold Path as a secular or a worldly path concerned with our world, it seems to me that we need to give more warmth, as it were, to those elements that otherwise remain more on the periphery rather than at the center of our practice. And the very notion of engaged Buddhism, I think, is trying to say something similar. But at the same time, it's acknowledging that traditionally Buddhist practice hasn't been terribly engaged. We need to somehow bring in an element of social engagement, let's say, uh, because it's tacitly acknowledged that that's not really been so prominent in traditional schools of Buddhism. So a secular account, therefore, um, is, I think, called upon to find a reordering, a resequencing of these elements, uh, and also a much more fluid relationship with the whole process, recognizing that each of us, perhaps, is tasked with organizing the elements of the path in a way that fits our temperament, in a way that fits the needs of our world. So we don't have to remain locked into the, the classical eightfold path as found in pretty much every book that's been written on Buddhism. I was recently in Japan and um, I presented this same, I passed around this same paper to my Japanese hosts at the uh, Musashino University and there was a certain reaction to it basically you can't do that there's something uh, somehow taboo about tampering which might be a word that would be used against this with such a classical doctrine you know what sort of authority do you have to to mess around with something like this well, that points to the fact that there's an uh, assumption that there are certain things that can't be changed. But the hens and eggs metaphor, I think, challenges that very directly. But we don't even have to stay just with that particular metaphor. In terms of the Eightfold Path, we also find another, not so much a, a, a metaphor, but a parable, or an allegory uh, that is found in the connected discourses of the Buddha, 
uh, the Sanyutta Nikaya, uh, and there you find a text called the Nagara Sutta, the discourse on the city. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, quite famous. But in the discourse of the city, the Buddha presents himself or compares himself, let's say, to a person who has wandered off into a forest. And in that forest has come across the remains of an ancient path. And he follows this ancient path and it leads him to the ruins of an ancient city. And having seen this, he then returns to his own city, his own place where he lives, and he asks the king and the ministers if they could not embark on a restoration, a rebuilding of this ancient city. And the king and the ministers agree, and so the community then sets out to restore this ancient city. Now, in explaining the allegory, uh, Gautama then uh, says that um, the ancient path is like the eightfold path followed by the Buddhas of the past. Uh, in other words, this ancient path is not just his own invention, it's something that he feels is uh, something already present in in his, among his ancestors, and you might think of that in almost mythological terms, but it's actually acknowledging that this is something that's not just an idea that he's concocted, but it seems to carry with him a weight of ancestral authority in some regards. But the point is that the Eightfold Path, or this ancient path, is one that leads to a city, uh, the ruins of a city that can then be restored and rebuilt in such a way, as the text says, that once more the city was flourishing, it was well populated, it was prosperous, it was beautiful, it was secure. He said there are solid ramparts around the city, it's a safe space, a protected space that it is one in which there are beautiful ponds and lakes and gardens. It also has an aesthetic dimension to it. And it's a place of prosperity, a place where people flourish, is well populated. And again, we can tease out the implications of that uh, image as well. But the point that's relevant here is that here the Eightfold Path is not the Eightfold Path that leads to the end of suffering. It's the Eightfold Path that leads to the, res the restoration of a city, the rebuilding of a city, which is an eminently secular idea. The Nagara Sutta, the, 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 the discourse on the city, is, I think, alone in presenting the Eightfold Path as culminating in a city rather than in the ending of suffering. But in a way that is likely to be um, an idea that goes back to the Buddha precisely because it's an idea that you don't find in the rest of the texts. It's not something that would likely have been added at a later point. I could go on and on about this, but I'm not going to. The point is, whatever I'm right or wrong on about all of those speculations, is that here we have a model in the earliest strata of Buddhist literature that recognizes the Eightfold Path as that which leads to a renewal of this world in some way, uh, bringing into being uh, another way of living in, on this planet, as we might put it now. And again, we may not think of this city today so much literally, but as metaphorically, as about creating a, a collective space, uh, a collective uh, structures, maybe in a virtual sense uh, today, maybe in a global sense perhaps, uh, in which these values that are embedded in the Eightfold Path into the eight eggs 
can, can be given a framework within which they can optimally be warmed and cared for in such a way that these, um, these eggs hatch. And the hatching of this cluster of eggs could thereby be seen um, as the giving birth to a new kind of society, a new kind of culture in this world. So that provides me with a, uh, a, a canonical foundation for imagining what I call here a worldly eightfold path. And the way in which I've resequenced them, as we'll be going over in the course of this week, um, is as follows. Um, I start with um, mindfulness and concentration, which traditionally are at the end of the path. I've now put them at the beginning. And one of the reasons that I've done that is because in the context of a secular Buddhism, many people actually enter this path not by agreeing to you know, hold certain Buddhist views, but through their experience of mindfulness. Mindfulness is, I think in many respects, the Buddhist practice that has, most, uh, has been most effective in finding uh, its way into the contemporary world, uh, as all of you I'm certainly are aware. Uh, this is the entry gate um, for many people who are now drawn to the Buddhist teaching. It's not through having been given some explanation of Buddhist doctrine or theory or whatever, it's by having experienced for themselves, and maybe not even in a Buddhist context, in a health-related issues or at a workshop in their business uh, uh, life or from doing any number of activities that are now somehow framed within the perspective of mindfulness. And mindfulness is not just some marginal practice within Buddhism, one amongst many others. It's at the very core of the Buddha's Dharma. In the, mind, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha opens the text by saying mindfulness is the direct path to nirvana itself, to this, what I would call, this non-reactive state of mind. So mindfulness is right at the heart of it. And the mindfulness that is practiced by Sydney, who's gone to her you know, doctor to get some help in dealing with her panic attacks is exactly the same practice as a monk in the forests of Burma um, is doing in order to attain uh, liberation from birth and death. The basic act of becoming mindful is the same. It's about learning to stop, to step back, and to notice what's going on within you and around you in such a way that you can respond to that situation, the panic attack, whatever it might be, uh, in a way that's not determined by your habit patterns, your reactivity, your greed, your hatred, your confusions. That's the basic turning around in the heart of your own experience from a reactive life to a responsive life, to a life that is driven by habit and instinct and social and political religious conditioning to one in which you begin to find your own autonomy and authority to respond kindly, wisely, imaginatively, creatively to your situation. And I think therefore that purely on that basis, the Eightfold Path begins there. And that is then further developed through becoming more competent in such practices, through collectedness, through focus, through concentration. And then I think, having achieved a certain groundedness and depth in one's life and stability, are you able to reconsider, you know, what are your primary values? What are your, your goals in life? 
not just what you've been told to believe by authority figures, but what really matters for you most. And that leads you into a, another perspective, and from there into a way of imagining another way to live in this world. And from there then, and I'm not going to go into any detail now, we move into the, the latter four elements, application, um, survival, work, and voice. So that's the way that I've reconfigured the Eightfold Path, I've reordered and reshuffled the eggs uh, to some considerable extent through the inspiration of the philosopher Hannah Arendt, who was mentioned also this morning. We may touch on some of her work too. But that's essentially where I'm coming from and why I wish to, uh, to share this perspective uh, with you and with the help of my colleagues, uh, Winton and Lenore, and also with all of you here. Um, so I hope that's given you a taster at least of what we're going to be exploring together this week. And um, we still have just under half an hour and I've deliberately left that time so that I can get some feedback from you, uh, some response from, uh, from anyone here, um, possibly related to what I just said, possibly related to what's written in this text, or possibly related to some other concerns that you're bringing to this retreat. Um, remember that our friends out on the, um, uh, who are at home uh, need to hear these questions and Guy will be passing round the microphone. So if you want to say something, please put up your hand and don't start speaking till you have the mic. And likewise, uh, those of you at home, if you have a point or comment you want to make, then press the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that uh, raises a hand, and we'll see that little yellow hand. Are all of the screens visible on this here? Okay. And, and what we'll do is we'll just see someone on screen. You might be more obvious to yourself, or might be on full screen. Oh, good. Okay, so you'll get speak of you. You'll speak of you, them. Yeah, brilliant. Good. And since we're new to each other, many of us, please could you give your name? My name's Susie. Um, Stephen, I, 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 I've never quite seen the Eightfold Path as a sequential arrangement, um, but, but I'm getting from what you're saying, it's, a, it's somewhat to do with the amount of emphasis on certain aspects um, and recognising, as you said, mindfulness as an entry point a lot of the time. So, so, I, so I suppose, is it, do most people actually see it as a, a linear, sequential way of considering how to liberate themselves? Uh, I, well, I can't speak for most people, but the reality is that if you look up the Eightfold Path anywhere, you'll find that they're given in that particular sequence. And the way in which I was taught the Eightfold Path um, by my Tibetan teachers and other teachers, is that is basically the way in which these ideas are always presented. Uh, and, and I think there's a bit of a struggle because I don't think it follows that naturally sometimes. But clearly, you start with the, the way your right view and you end up with a meditation practice. That's the way it's framed. Um, and so there's, you know, whatever the intention was behind that, nonetheless, that will be how many people will assume the sequence operates. I think for those of us who have practiced for any length of time, we probably don't see it that way. We might focus on one element rather than another. But I'm a theologian, if you wish, and I'm interested in um, trying to find a way of presenting this material that, that queries some of these time-honoured uh, assumptions and experimenting with new ways of organizing the material and 
you know, hearing people react to that, often, you know, with a big question, you know, you can't do that. Well, what's behind the, you can't do that? Why is there a resistance? What is it that is somehow is coming across as slightly provocative, let's say? Go, 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 we need the mic. You would take and, okay, could, and your name? Tim. Tim. Yes, Tim. If you change that, you take the house of cards down. <laughs> um, if you change that, you knock the house of cards down. Yes, I think there is an element of that. And that's the fear. I agree with you. I think that's right. It's, uh, it's somehow threatening, not just that particular sequence, but it's threatening to the idea of, of, of the assumptions of an orthodoxy. The orthodoxy is somehow put on the spot and might feel threatened in some ways. I agree, yeah. Oh, it was you. I'm no, so it's sorry. Him. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, continuing on that thread, how much do you uh, placate? Might be too strong a word, but how how do you massage some of your delivery with wanting to really revolutionise these methods of distributing these teachings against an orthodoxy? Do you try to bring them along? Are you asking them to kind of put up or shut up like i'm very interested as to how people like because i'm very interested in this but i'm also seeing the buddhist cultures around me not interested in this kind of uh, reinterpretation so uh, ha uh some help i guess or some insight into the skillfulness and how you go about it and some problems that you've had that kind of thing please <laughs> um i mean i've I, I published a book in 1997 called Buddhism Without Beliefs, and this was initially conceived as uh, an introduction to Buddhism for people who didn't know much about Buddhism, that would not use Buddhist terminology and so forth and so on, and it all seemed like a fairly innocent venture. But because I suggested that you didn't have to believe in reincarnation to be a Buddhist, this triggered a reaction that I was very, very surprised about. Um, it clearly didn't down, go down at all well. And certain leading figures in the Buddhist world wrote lengthy rebuttals of this thing, Bhikkhu Bodhi being one of them, Sangharakshita being another. Um, and, and, so, and I was surprised by this. Um, I don't think I was too surprised that there was this reaction from you know, the orthodox Buddhists, but I was surprised by the vehemence of it and the extent to which it basically closed doors. Uh, Buddhists are generally nice, kind, you know, gentle people. So they don't always get aggressive, but they respond. Um, I describe it as uh, the a typical response is the, is, the, is the quiet closing of doors. In other words, you suddenly feel you're excluded. You're no longer sort of invited to participate in trans Buddhist events. Uh, and you do get a, f a fair bit, not a huge amount, of actual aggressive emails and so on. But what I found most disappointing is that nobody really wanted to discuss these things. There wasn't really an openness to any kind of dialogue. And um, even amongst the Buddhist traditions in which I trained, I trained as a Gelugpa, which from the, you know, one of the things that attracted me to that approach was that um, you know, you mustn't just take these things on trust. Uh, we'd often be told this, in this uh, recited this verse that where probably goes back to the Buddha, that you should analyze my teachings just as a goldsmith analyzes gold. And you shouldn't take them just because you have faith in me. And that's given as a justification in the Tibetan tradition uh, to apply reason and analysis and debate to really, you know, question these things before accepting them. And that's often what is the Buddhist position. You know, we're, 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 this is not blind faith. You really must check these things out. But basically what I learned is you need to check these things out until you arrive at the orthodox position. <laughs> and if you haven't arrived at the orthodox position, you haven't checked them out enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's 
sometimes the case. Um, and I must admit that uh, I found this rather unsettling, personally. I found it, uh, um, yeah, I find it somewhat distressing, uh, this, the, this reaction. But over the years, um, I found that I'm not the only person who thinks along these lines. Uh, many people have responded to my work with gratitude, saying, well, that's kind of what I always felt, but I didn't have the courage to say it, or in my Buddhist group, you can't say that kind of stuff, or you get marginalized. Um, so I realized that I was, I was serving as the voice of uh, quite a number of people who um, uh, otherwise felt that they, didn't, they weren't somehow heard in the Buddhist world. And that's a while ago now, that's like 25 years ago. And um, I think since then, there's slowly been, not, it's not been no great movement, that's for sure, but there's slowly emerged a kind of, a, you know, a sort of community, I feel. And I've really, you know, it's quite strange for me in a way that I hear people talk about secular Buddhism as though it's a kind of fait accompli. Uh, rather than just an idea that's floating in the ether. And that is quite inspiring to me. And particularly, um, I mean, what was very moving for me in the last month or so, I've been in Japan, and for the first time ever, I've been invited by a traditional Buddhist school, founded in the 13th century by Shinran, to engage in dialogue with priests and thinkers of that school, and to be, you know, to be accepted as someone who perhaps had something to say to them. And I found that that happened 25 years ago. And so that I find, you know, really quite a vindication of having, as it were, trusted my own intuitions and had, you know, the, 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 uh, the foolhardiness, you might say, to to, to stay, say these things and state them. So um, it's an ongoing project, clearly, but I do feel more and more confident that I'm not alone in these views and that um, they might be part of a process of renewal within the Buddhist tradition. I've also been very inspired by particularly liberal Protestant theologians who likewise you know, back in the 60s, people like John Robinson and Selby Spong and Don Cupid have made similar kind of radical, or Paul Tillich, for example, Bultmann and others. Um, their example in their Christian context has also been very important for me because I've seen it going on elsewhere or in the, Jew, in the, in, in the Jewish community as well. Uh, yes. Yes. A name, please? Des. Des. Um, so in your, you're talking about sort of a traditional view of the Eightfold Path, that the emphasis on the, um, on the, on the mindfulness, on the contemplative side, uh, for the purpose of ending suffering or moving through an individual liberation. Um, and that then the way the path is structured, that comes at the end. Mm. So basically you have to toughen up in order to get there, to be able to be open to, to deal with that mm. and to be able to see reality or the truth. Mm. Um, whereas I, looking at yours, um, your, uh, my, my reading is, and I haven't read the whole document, but just in terms of the, the order that the opposite is happening, that the individual side, the, the training, which is, uh, mindfulness, um, collectedness, perspective, imagination, is, is the training uh, on the individual basis to a degree. And then you move more into the societal, and that's where the application, mm -hmm. application sits, um, survival, work, and it's in community and it's built engaged side of Buddhism mm -hmm. and building a better world, uh, world. So the voice at the, at the end, which of course um, for most of us in this room now is, leaves us feeling shameful, um, referring to the referendum that failed, um, that this is giving voice to our humanity mm -hmm. in, in, in your world. 
That's exactly, exactly what I'm trying to do, yeah. No, you phrased it very well. And I hope that over the course of this week, we'll be able to flesh out each of these particular points. Um, but yeah, I find from, from, and again, I can speak quite personally here. I think this goes back, what's your name again? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph's point. If I, if I look back in, I've been doing, I've been in this business for over 50 years now. And so I feel I have a certain kind of, uh, um, I don't know, a certain kind of you know, authority that comes from the sheer involvement with the material. But I think in many ways what has really been for me the most important part of my practice is the finding of my own voice. Uh, and not just as an individual voice, although that's obviously part of it, but by also being able to give a voice to those who feel they're not being heard. And voice, of course, is quite explicitly the way that we communicate with others. It's, it, it's, it's meaningless outside of a, a social network of some kind or another. And it's also a kind of empowerment. That, I think, is important, to have the courage to speak your mind. And so I see this, the more contemplative side of the practice is giving you a groundedness in your, you know, your felt experience, your immediate experience, opening up a non-reactive space of attention and awareness uh, that then provides you with a, a foundation on which to build a life in the world in which you can find your own voice, you can find your own way, and you can speak out. So in this way, rather, it's engaged Buddhism I think is a very good idea. But in many of the ways in which it's presented, it's kind of seen as like an optional extra. You do your Buddhist practice, and if you want to, then yeah, you should do a bit some social engagement and go and be an activist or do whatever it is. But it's not really, uh, it's sort of seen as something you add on, a sort of a, an additional element. It's not built into the actual structure or the framework of the practice itself. What I'm trying to do here, by reconfiguring the Eightfold Path, is to make uh, engagement, if you wish, as, as, as integral to the whole process. It's not something you add on. In some respects, it's actually where the practice leads. Uh, and in that, that, sorry? Oh, okay. Oh, Rurika. Is that okay? Let's should we move out here? Ruriko, hi. Hi, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, thank you for mentioning about the um, Sashino University, uh, the Japanese university. I actually uh, received a question from faculty members uh, regarding the community or the Sangha uh, to play a role in this new worldly uh, eightfold class. Um, there is certain assumptions, and I believe that it is a logical assumption to say that the Sangha has worked as a way to be like a, holding a mirror to each other, to uh, work as a self-reflection methodology as well, too, in the interactions, as you have just mentioned. So um, just... Um, leaving the orthodoxy monastic life as they are, what would be the community of the worldly eightfold paths to be cultivated? How the community will be like? Okay. Maybe you are going to talk about it later on in this program. Oh. Well, well, we'll see. I mean, I'd be happy to respond to that because I think that's where this notion of voice somehow leads. Uh, voice refers to how you speak to one another, how you communicate with one another. It may not necessarily be through words, it might be through art, it might be through music. It's the way you find expression of what matters to you most deeply. And in this way, it understands Sangha or community. Uh, and I'm meaning this in, in maybe a slightly narrower sense in the way we use the word sangha, intentional communities. Um, instead of intentional communities uh, being groups of people who all sign up to the same set of ideas and beliefs, 
uh, it understands community more as um, a, uh, a framework or a, a group of people who have sufficient trust in one another to be able to engage and communicate and speak in ways that are much more real, we might say. They're not, it's not just a bunch of people who chat and have tea parties and stuff, though that can go on too, of course. Uh, but it's a space in which you can really articulate to others what you feel most deeply about what matters and likewise to be open to hearing what the other is saying. There's something about voice that is necessarily dialectical. It's a back and a forth. It's not just one person you know, telling others what to do. Uh, in some of the classical traditional Buddhist models, you only the teacher's voice is to be listened to and followed, and that's often for good reasons. Uh, but there's not much of a, of a dialogue going on. Um, its uh, authority is concentrated in the monks or in a teacher figure of some kind, and the other students are those who are, uh, the other mem members are were re recipients of that wisdom, and they are called upon to put that into practice, but not to question it. Um, the Jewish philosopher, theologian Martin Buber, in one of his books, makes a distinction between a collective and a community. He's writing in the 1930s, so he probably has you know, Stalinism or something in mind. But for him, a collective is a group of people who effectively uh, sign up a certain doctrine, and that could be a religious doctrine, it could be a political doctrine, and the power of the community or the collective resides in everybody thinking in the same way, such that they can then act in the world uh, in a single, you know, uh, in a non-conflicted way. Uh, this, I think, is the case in, you know, in, in many kinds of, of human organizations. And if you start to question some of the basic beliefs or doctrines of your religion or your political party, then generally you are excluded quite quickly if you're not actually you know, silenced in some slightly sinister way. Um, and that was my experience, to be quite honest, uh, with my Buddhist communities, uh, my original Buddhist community. Um, once I started voicing these ideas, basically people I thought who were of as my friends were just no longer interested in, in having anything to do with me. So that wasn't a community that in which any kind of meaningful dialogue and debate could actually take place. That was considered to be somehow against the rules. It was... It was weakening the collective power of the group. Whereas for Buber, a community is where each member of the community um, seeks to optimize the other member's capacity to flourish as human individuals. So in other words, uh, a Sangha in that sense is about empowering each person to become themselves. It's actually a celebration of difference, not a suppression of difference. It welcomes dissenting voices. It doesn't fear them. And that's the kind of community, I think, that is possibly the one that's the most healthy for the people involved, and hopefully also one that would be able to flourish not just as individuals, but also as... Um, you know, as a number of different people from different backgrounds committed to similar values, but articulating and expressing them and sharing them in their own distinctive ways. So something like that, Rurika. But that's very vague. And how one would actualize that is a much more important question. Um, the lady at the back here, Carol, I think. Oh, over here, okay. You, you, you caught your... Okay, you can be quick. I guess, just to follow up to that then, what are some examples of that sort of community that you see where there is that openness, um, not necessarily to do with Buddhism, mm -hmm. but in, in the world where there is a respect for debate and a respect for difference of opinions, but also has, serves a real purpose? Well, the best example are the Quakers. 
uh, I've always been inspired by the model of the Quakers, because there you don't have a priesthood. Each member of the, of the and they, they call themselves, they're the Society of Friends. It's friendship that keeps the community together. And in a service, in a Quaker service, uh, each member of that community has an equal right to, to, to be moved by the spirit or whatever they call it, and to address the, the community. And in terms of, uh, of, a, of a small scale religious institution, it's never grown to be a worldwide you know, huge thing like the Catholic Church. Um, they've had a disproportionate impact on social reform and change. The Quakers are very much at the, uh, the, at the front of the movement to abolish slavery, for example, uh, for industrial uh, workers' rights in 19th century Europe. Um, a community that really is a community of caring for one another. So that, to me, would be a very good example, I would say. Um, yes, so my name's Carol, mm -hmm. and actually your, your use of the word caring there kind of relates to what I wanted to say, that, you know, in a world in crisis, what lessons do we have to kind of deal with that? How do we act in, in a world with so many crises? And one of your handouts was the cartography of care. Yeah. So again, this word care keeps coming mm. up again and again. And so the question for me has been, how, how do we take care of ourselves and how do we take care of each other? How do we take care of others? And so for me, you're putting mind um, I think this is just died. Oh, there we go. Uh, putting mindfulness first is one of the ways we can become strong and centered and calm within ourselves because those are the qualities we need in order to care for others. Mm -hmm. And so to me, having mindfulness kind of, you know, really at the center just makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to qualify mindfulness. If you look at my text, page five, um, I offer a, an, an understanding of mindfulness that goes quite far beyond uh, just being mindful of body, feelings, perceptions, although that's, I do think, at the heart of it. But I think we need to extend the notion of mindfulness to be much more mindful of the kind of world we live in, of the, I mean, I start, in fact, with... Uh, being mindful of the Big Bang. Uh, to, mi to be mindful is to recollect what matters in a way. And in fact, in the early Buddhist texts, you have practices of mindfulness that you don't find in the four standard mindfulnesses. You have the mind mindfulness of, of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, for example. And when I first came across the idea of mindfulness, it wasn't in the early Buddhist traditions. It was in a Mahayana text called the Bodhisattva Chari Avatara, the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life by Shanti Deva, which I translated from Tibetan. And there, mindfulness is understood as being mindful of, of your values, being mindful of your vows, being mindful of your I think another dimension of it, um, which has much more to do with, with ethics, really, than just being mindful of your bodily, you know, bo bodily sensations and feelings and so on. And I think all of these elements of mindfulness need to be, to be brought together and to expand the notion of mindfulness so that it's not purely about your own subjective experience. And you find it in the sutta, in the text too, it says you're mindful of the body of yourself and the body of others. That's often forgotten, but it is quite clearly there that to be mindful of the body is not just to be mindful of your body, it's to be mindful of others' bodies, others' feelings, others' perceptions, and so forth and so on. But yes, I agree with you. I think mindfulness is a, is, is a, is a, is a very good starting point and foundation for building that kind of community that we may be able to imagine. Um, we kind of... A few more minutes. I don't want to. One of the things we might do in this retreat is start cutting into the meditation time, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what's happening now. So, in some ways, I prefer to stop now, 
and go into the meditation. And if we could have these questions as the first two for the next session. Could we do that? Is that okay? Vivian, is that all right? Yes. Lenore, was it? Okay, well, I'm certain we'll come back to the notion of Sangha, and I'm very glad it's come up, because I know many of you have Sanghas, intentional communities. So let's make a point of bringing the focus back more and more, again and again, to the, the, the actual practice of Sangha, rather than the idea of it. So we're now going to um, conclude the evening with 30 minutes of sitting, Lenore, will you ring the bell? Thank you. So you might want to stand up, stretch a bit, and um, then we'll um, continue.